was pushing for inviting me. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure and honor to be here and to uh, share with you some of these, uh, these ideas. Um, I think that some of what I will be talking about today will be very different. I mean, everybody's talking about different things, but it's some of the ideas I'll be presenting may be foreign to you. Uh, if, if they are, don't hesitate really to interrupt me if, um, if I go too fast, if I say something that's unclear to you. I don't find questions while I'm talking. So the, the topic of um, the, uh, the topic of my talk is uh, two different ways of thinking about creations, and therefore getting at the issue of creativity. And uh, for me, this uh, cover from a Time magazine uh, publication from several years ago sums up much of what I want to talk about today: the confusion or the conflation of a variety of ideas that fall into the issue under the issue of creation. We have here God's genes, and there is the DNA inside the mind. And this is exactly sort of the theme of my talk today, has to do with our confusion of these ideas and our use of very complicated ideas and words uh, that often create problems when we're trying to understand complex phenomena. And here's a blow up of, of the cover. It says, does our DNA compel us to seek a higher power Believe it or not, some scientists say yes. And for me, this cover, in all of its, um, in all of these ways, sums up much of what I see as a problem in modern psychology and modern biology. So what I will talk about today, to summarize, is that creationism, that is the notion that God created the world, that form of thinking we call creationism, is more than an anti-evolutionary perspective it reflects a way of thinking that I call designer thinking. Designer thinking can be detected in many disciplines and is an implicit theme of two very popular ideas within psychology and biology. Nativism, the notion that we are born with certain high cognitive capacities, and evolutionary psychology, the notion that our cognitions have been shaped and are determined by our evolutionary past. Identifying and protecting against designer thinking has been and continues to be crucial uh, for scientific progress, I maintain. I will illustrate this perspective in two ways. First, by looking at creations and how they develop. By, by that I mean inventions, human inventions. And I will argue that even human inventions develop. And creative development. That biological development is a creative process and anomalous creatures, things that have been called in the past freaks and monsters, can help us see how development is a creative process. And I will end by simply claiming that creativity is a developmental process. Well, the background of my talk goes back to a problem in philosophy. It's called the argument for design. And it was stated perhaps most famously, but by no means the first time, by an English historian by the name of William Taylor. He said, suppose, he wrote, suppose I had found a watch upon the ground, and it should be inquired how the watch happened to be in that place. The inference, we think, is inevitable. There cannot be a design without a designer, contrivance without a contriver. Design must have had a designer. That designer must have been a person. That person was God. That is a classic statement of the argument for design. David Hume, the English philosopher in the 18th century, um, in his dialogues concerning natural religion, um, put it this way. Consider and anatomize the eye, survey its structure and contrivance, and tell me from your own feeling if the idea of a contriver does not immediately flow in upon you with a force like that of sensation. The most obvious conclusion surely is in favor of design. David Hume in that same book in 1776, uh, in making fun of the argument from design, said, Thus, for all we know, our world was only the first rude essay of some infant deity who afterwards abandoned it ashamed of his lame performance. So this is basically the uh, making fun of design by pointing out the imperfections of nature. Stephen Jay Gould, the evolutionary biology put it, biologist, put it differently. That same idea. Odd arrangements and funny solutions are the proof of evolution, paths that a sensible god would never tread, but that a natural process constrained by history follows per force. So the two ways to, 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 to go after the argument of design is to talk about the imperfections of design. Things like the blind spot in the case of the eye, 
point out a perfect design and you say a rational God would have never done it that way. And an alternative method is to look for intermediate forms. In the case of the eye, looking for animals that have uh, intermediate forms of eyes that give us some idea about the evolution of this structure. Nonetheless, despite all of the successes of evolutionary theory, creationists are everywhere. So here's my argument. Creationism is a framework for explaining the origins of the universe and life on our planet. But it also reflects a style of thinking, what I call designer thinking, that has had an impact far beyond the evolution debate. Designer thinking has played a role in many important issues, including learning, human invention, and development, as well as the nature and function of DNA. And in their attempt to understand complex behavior and cognition, nativists and evolutionary psychologists and many others fall into the trap of designer thinking. So designer thinking is as troublesome for our understanding of animal behavior, including human behavior, as it is for our understanding of animal form. The basic problem is this. We have complex phenomena. How do we, how do we explain it? Very often, the temptation is to place some creative force into the universe, into the mind, into the DNA, and from there, attempt to understand uh, that complexity. So evolutionary psychologists and nativists both endorse content-specific solutions to ancestral problems, which they instantiate in the form of neural modules, modules in the brain that are predetermined, that develop irrespective of the developmental history of that animal, human being, that creates certain types of responses, be it jealousy, aggression, love, you name it. They usually specify genetic control over these behaviors and innate, that is inborn, programming of behavior. And underlying all of this is the specter of a concept called instinct, one of the most distorting, unfathomable concepts in, in science today. Let me show you how. So I wrote about this in a book. I'm happy to say it was translated into Japanese. Um, I, I'm told that it was, it was a good, tr good translation of, of what I wrote. I have no way, of course, of confirming that. Um, but Patrick Bateson from the uh, United Kingdom, uh, Sir Patrick Bateson, uh, talked about the problem with the concept of instinct this way, simply by pointing out the very many different definitions that are out there. It can be used to mean present at birth, something that's not learned, developed before it can be used, unchanged once it's developed, shared by all members of a species, organized into a distinct behavioral system, served by a distinct neural module, adapted during evolution, individual with differences attributable to genes. These are all the different ideas that the instinct concept has been has tried to, to encompass. And the problem is that, of course, not all of these things go together in all different situations. You can disentangle them. So this same concept is used as a throwaway concept, basically to over, overtake or simply to gloss over to throw a blanket over the real complex phenomena that we are seeking to, to understand. And nativists and evolutionary psychologists rely heavily on the instinct concept, but they don't define which concept they're actually using. And I'll get to the language instinct in a little bit. So how did we get here? We got here through a very interesting route. First, of course, like all things, everything starts with Charles Darwin. And Charles Darwin, uh, of course, tried to understand form. He also tried to understand behavior. But really, many people give Conrad Lawrence a lot of uh, uh, credit for taking Darwinian concepts and applying it to the field of behavior. Now, Lawrence had a very famous and very heated dispute with B.F. Skinner, the American psychologist, who founded the School of American Behaviorism, um, over the issue of what is learned and what is unlearned. But there was another thread that most, many people don't know that's a very important thread in the history of our understanding of behavior. And it starts with an American psychologist named T.C. Schnella, uh, who really tried to change the, our concept of experience, what we mean by experience, and try to broaden the concept to encompass all of the different ways in which our developmental experience, our close experiences, our distant experiences, shape who we are as organisms. And he had um, a number of followers, Gilbert Gottlieb, shown here with Singy and Quo, um, another uh, influential Chinese um, psychologist, and Daniel Larimer who also had a very big fight with Conrad Lawrence over the notion of genetic and epigenetic processes in the guidance of behavior. And what we see now in the history of the field is that Conrad Lawrence has been followed by people like Donald Griffin, 
like Elizabeth Spelke, a nativist from Harvard University, or Steven Pinker, who's now also a nativist who's also at Harvard University. And all of this goes back to Conrad Lawrence and revolves around this issue of innate, predestined, and designed outcomes of cognition, of behavior. So, I maintain that the notions of gods, genes, minds, and designs are all linked together and often mushed together and blurred in such a way that we often don't know uh, how similar these concepts are in the history of our thought. So David Hume, once again, and if we are not contented with calling the first the supreme cause of God or deity, the desire, the desire to vary the expression, what can we call him but mind or thought? to which he is justly supposed to bear a considerable resemblance. Or Fred Nyhout, American evolutionary biologist, a developmental biologist, he said, biologists often employ two metaphors about genes, that genes control development and that genomes embody programs for development. Although these metaphors have an admirable sharpness and punch, they, need, uh, they lead, when taken literally, to highly distorted pictures of developmental processes. And Evelyn Fox Keller, in a wonderful book called The Century of the Gene, writes, attributing to the gene the capacity to direct or control development, effectively credited with a kind of mentality, the ability to plan and delegate. Even to this day, the gene is sometimes referred to as the cell's brain. These are ancient problems, really, in our historical thought, in Western philosophy primarily, which continues to have a huge impact on the way we talk about these phenomena. So I have talked about what explains the complexity of the human eye. Darwin solved that problem. Design, I'm sorry, he, he went against this problem. Prior to Darwin, people would say design to the action of design, divine creation. What explains the complexity of the human cognition? Many people would say design to the action of consciousness or thought. What explains the complexity of development? Design to the action of genes. Let me give you another example of how people use genes in this design way. What explains the spooky similarities of identical twins reared apart? I'm sure you've all, you're all familiar with these twin studies and how they show these incredible similarities. Let me give you an example uh, promoted by Steven Pinker, very famously, about two people by the name, they're called the Jim Twins, Jim Springer and Jim Lewis, were raised by different families in Ohio, with Jim Springer being raised by his biological parents after their reunion at the age of 39. Researchers noted that each of the Jim twins has been married twice, first to a Linda, then to a Betty. Their sons were named James Allen and James Allen. As children, they each had a pet dog named Toy. When they grew up and got married, each twin's family vacationed in the same beach area of Florida in the United States, and they drove to their vacation spot in light blue Chevrolets. And both twins smoked sale cigarettes and occasionally drank Miller Lite. Now, these are twins. They were separated at birth, presumably. They didn't know each other. How do you do this? Well, he argues, many people are skeptical of such anecdotes. Are the parallels just coincidences, the overlap that is inevitable when two biographies are scrutinized in enough detail? Clearly not. Researchers are repeatedly astonished by the spooky similarities they discover in their identical twins reared apart, but that never appear in their fraternal twins reared apart. Now here's what you have to believe in order to believe this and take it at face value. You have to believe that genes cause you to marry people with the same English names. You have to believe that genes cause you to name your children certain names. You have to believe that genes cause you to name your pet dog toy. You have to believe that when you grow up and get married, genes are going to cause you to vacation in the same spot of Florida and drive to it in the same color American terrible car Chevrolet. You have to believe. It. I'm saying that in Japan. That's my that's my that's my bow to Japanese uh, cars. Um, but that's what you have to believe. And also that you're going to drink. You know, you're going to smoke sandwich cigarettes and drink like beer. The thing is that this was not written as a joke. This was written seriously. And think what you have to believe. In order to believe that, this is not just any person, this is Stephen Baker, one of the best selling science writers in the world. And many people consider him to be one of the de deepest thinkers about psychology. But think about what you have to believe. Many people accept these things and they say, wow, genes, those are some powerful things. 
because they caused me to go to Florida and like Blue Chevrolet. What explains the ingenuity of human invention? Genes through the action of reason. I don't want to go into too much detail about this, I don't have a lot of time, but um, one of Charles Darwin's um, disciples, especially in the area of comparative study of behavior, was somebody by the name of George Romanes. And George Romanes, he was an English gentleman, he had a, a, a beautiful, um, he had a coachman, somebody who drove around, you know, and he had a nice house with a fence out front, and he had a cat that belonged to this coachman, and this hat, cat was able to open the, lake, the gate uh, in the front of the house. And George Romanes, confronted with complexity, how does a cat know how to open a gate, said, very famously, if a hand can do it, why not a paw? Okay? This is a classic example of what I mean by looking at a complex problem and assuming you know the answer simply by observing it. And he came up with imitation. The cat was imitating the people who went up to the gate and opened the door. All right, Edward Thorndike read this and was very, very angry, an American psychologist, one of the founders of the School of American Behaviorism, and he devised something called the Law of Effect. What he did was he took cats and he put them outside of these puzzles they called puzzle boxes, and these cats were then put in, they were hungry, and they lashed around inside this thing, and they eventually learned how to get out. The question is, how? Now, um, he made fun of George Romanes. He said, you know, dogs get lost hundreds of times and no one ever notices it or sends an anecdote to a scientific magazine. But let one find his way from Brooklyn to Yonkers and the fact immediately becomes a circulating anecdote. He was making fun of George Romanes. But I actually, listening to Harold's talk this morning, uh, Albert Einstein really said the same thing. I copied this into my talk. I don't know if that's cheating. Um, but Albert Einstein said, this combinatorial play seems to be the essential feature of creative thought. And I say, absolutely. Combinatorial play. The cat is lashing about inside of that box, and he eventually hits the right spot, and he learns the law of effect. The effect of getting out of the box shapes that animal's behavior to the point where it learns how to get outside of the puzzle box. And I think that this is analogous to what Einstein was talking about. Combinatorial play. The word play there is very important. Varying your behavior such a way as to produce an outcome which is good for you. And I think that's very much similar to the notion of creativity. Another uh, issue comes up with the issue of human invention. You're all familiar with a mousetrap. Mousetraps are considered one of the paragons of human invention and design. Michael Behe, one of the proponents of intelligent design in the United States, took a flagellum of a, of a, of a bacteria, of a bacterium, and he drew it the way a human inventor might draw a flagellum. And he said, see, this is a human invention. This is God's invention. This is a sign of intelligent design. So that's the question. What is the actual relationship between a human invention and natural inventions? And so we are likely to say that this is a product of design. And we wonder whether this is a product of design. Darwin would say no. Michael Behe would say yes. But the problem is that in actuality, even designers don't believe that design works the way we believe it is, right? So for example, Thomas Edison wrote, inventors fail their way to success. Just like the cat fails its way to getting outside of the box. It lashes around and has lots of failures, but then it hits the right latch and it gets out. It fails its way to success. Einstein said the same, I mean, Edison said the same thing happens. And the American engineer, Henry Petrosky, who writes beautifully about the evolution of human invention, writes, Artifacts do not spring fully formed from the mind of some maker, but rather become shaped and reshaped through the principally negative experiences of their users within the social, cultural, and technological context in which they are invented. In other words, we too easily assume that human inventions are the product of an individual sitting in a room thinking of a solution to a problem. In fact, trial and error defines human invention just as it defines how the cat gets outside of the puzzle box just as it defines much of actual evolutionary processes. One of the great examples he gives, and I understand I'm in a country that does not use, or is not famous for using these sorts of utensils, but one of his greatest uh, stories in this book, Petrovsky, in a book called The Evolution of Useful Things, is about the evolution of utensils. The first utensils were simply knives. You would pierce a piece of meat, and you would try to bring it to your mouth. The problem was the piece of meat would often just swirl on the end. It was a very awkward thing, and often the meat would fall off, fork out into your mouth. 
So the, the next step after the knife was to actually produce a two-pronged fork. But the problem with that was it did stabilize the meat, but it still wasn't very good at allowing the meat to come off easily, because often it came off too easily, and it was not considered ideal. So the next step was the three-pronged fork. We're talking human brains here. And the, the evolution of the three-pronged fork was considered better. And they kept going. And then there was the four-pronged fork. And there was either a time in, in Western history where a five-pronged fork came along, but then it was almost impossible to get the meat off the fork, so they went back to the four-pronged fork. And that's what we have today um, in most Western cultures is the four-pronged fork. But nobody sat in a room somewhere and said, I need a perfect way to eat meat. I think a four-pronged fork is the answer. Now, because it, it took hundreds of years for the evolution of this to occur. And of course, with the evolution of utensils, eventually there became a diversity of utensils. Uh, these are all the different kinds of utensils one can find in an American or European eating situation. And of course, there's another form of diversity out there in the world that has nothing to do with silverware. It has a lot to do with animals. And this is really, you know, I, I'm not uh, uh, talking about my research today. I'm, my research is nowhere along these lines. But this is where I spend most of my time, is in the world of, of the diversity of animals. And, you know, diversity comes in very, very many different forms. And you may not notice it at first when you look at this kind of a figure. So let's, here's some things that we consider to be successful animals. There's an embryonic elephant. Here is an animal called anglerfish. Uh, here is a blind mole rat. This is a skeleton of a jaboa. Uh, this is a star-nosed mole. This is an embryonic star-nosed mole. These are all good, evolutionarily acceptable creatures. And then there are others that we often refer to as freaks, monsters, anomalies. Conditions like um, uh, parasitic twin, dicephalus or two-headedness, diprosopia or two-faced condition. There's another case of dicephalus. Well, I became fascinated with these, this other form of diversity because this other form of diversity has not been treated well by evolutionary biologists. But I have maintained that monsters help us to appreciate development as a creative process. And if we only study normal or typical individuals, if we only study archetypes of species, that we feed the very same illusion that ensnares creationists. We encourage design and thinking. And what binds the anomalous and the typical is a common link to developmental process. What do I mean by that? If you look at all the different types of influences that work through development to create behavior or cognition, you see sensory stimulation, genetic activity, physical influences, work through this developmental black box to produce behavior which then feeds back onto these things to alter the next round of activity. And if we unpack this system and look at it, we see that there are genes down here in the cell, there's behavior up here, but look at all of the things that have to occur to get from genetic activity within the nucleus of a cell and the behavior that we actually observe in each, each and every one of us. There's a lot of intervening activity that must be understood in real time if we're going to unpack the complexity and understand how organisms actually develop and function. There is a theory right now, it's not really a theory, it's more like a framework, and it's called developmental systems theory, that attempts to place all of this in context, that attempts to refocus our energy away from thinking about predetermination, instinct, innateness, all of these ideas that have really, I say retarded, but that have impeded our ability to understand complexity um, towards a more comprehensive um, uh, framework that, that respects the actual complexity that exists in the world. First of all, it talks about development as a constructive process. Next, it talks about context, sensitivity, and contingency. Things are not predetermined in a contingent environment. And joint determination by multiple causes, including the notion of interchangeability. I will be giving you examples of several of these. Distributed control and extended inheritance. 
Harold alluded to this earlier, that inheritance no longer is linked exclusively to genetic transfer. Epigenetic processes, uh, non-genomic transfer of information across generations is now repeatedly being appreciated as an important factor uh, in evolution. So in, in our history, for the last hundred years anyway, and in part because of Darwin, we separated development and evolution into a dichotomy. In fact, throughout most of the 20th century, development was taken out of evolutionary theory and was considered to be unimportant uh, for the most part for understanding the evolution of organisms. So here you have a two-headed, you know, a lizard saying, you know, I'll pick the blue and I'll pick the red. I don't think we should be choosing. As I'll argue, development and evolution are, intri are intimately connected, inextricably linked uh, to each other. So, if you look at the history of this process and what happened, the linkage between development and evolution, first we begin with Darwin, uh, in which traditional Darwinian thought began with a strong commitment to incrementalism, the notion that evolutionary change is slow and continuous. And with the rise of the modern synthesis, because of people like Vygotsky, Ernst Meyer, and, um, and, and Ronald Fisher, uh, the modern synthesis in the 1930s Natural selection was widely viewed as an external force. I'm reminded of what Masatoshi was talking about earlier, of internal versus external. But in the case of the modern synthesis, it said evolution is an external force. You have random mutation, okay? And those random mutations provide the variability upon which natural selection can act. In the same way that a cat inside of a puzzle box produces variability upon which it can choose which aspects of that variability get it outside of the box. This is why behaviorist ideas have often been analogized with evolutionary thinking. But the modern synthesis very much is committed to increment, incrementalism, external forces acting on random mutations. But in the 1890s, as it now increasingly being reappreciated, William Bateson, an English uh, biologist, uh, who actually gave us the, the, the word genetic, as we understand it today, William Bateson saw that developmental variants can arise discontinuously and for a variety of reasons. In other words, he focused on internal forces of evolutionary change. Later, William Goldschmidt, a very well-known geneticist who was absolutely destroyed by the proponents of the modern synthesis because he used, a, he used the phrase hopeful monster, which got him in a lot of trouble. He was vilified, he was made fun of, um, he's still considered one of the great geneticists of the 20th century, but he wrote, we must not forget that what appears today as a monster will tomorrow be the origin of a line of special adaptations. The dachshund, speaking of dogs earlier, the dachshund and the bulldog are monsters. The first reptiles with rudimentary legs or fish species with bulldog heads were also monsters. In other words, perhaps some of these odd species we see out there begin as developmental variants. Okay. And Harold was talking about this as well earlier today, this issue of chance. And Pauling had a point. Well, what are the odds of all of these things happen if everything is due to random mutation? Okay? But what this argument, what Bateson was arguing was it's not purely random. Some developmental outcomes are more likely than others. Per Alberch in the 1980s um, echoed Bateson's view and appealed for renewed emphasis on the study of form from an internalist perspective. In particular, he argued that monsters provide a good starting point towards such a goal. They represent forms that lack adaptive function while preserving structural order. There is an internal logic to the genesis and transformation of such morphologies, and in that logic, we may learn about the constraints on the normal. And more recently, Mary Jane West Everhard, in a very thick but wonderful book with reading, said, to see pattern and extremes of variation is to glimpse the world as seen by natural selection. It is not a world of uniformly tiny, mutationally based, or exclusively quantitative variants. Rather, it is one full of recurrent developmental anomalies that vary in accord with the genetic makeup of individuals and also with their environmental circumstances. Unusual variation is abnormal, at least in the sense of being rare, and sometimes even grotesque. But anomalies represent new options to evolution. The options that anomalies offer are embedded within the mechanisms of design. So let's take a look at two of these anomalies, two of my favorite anomalies. This is Faith, the dog from Oklahoma City. Notice the lack of the two arms. This is Johnny Eck, a very famous uh, mid-20th century 
Let me show you how. Here's John. You see him? He has a condition known as an amelia. He doesn't have fully developed arm legs. So what happens with Jari Eck is, if you watch this again, watch how he moves. Watch him go down the stairs. And watch how elegantly he crosses it. It looks pretty natural to me. Here's Faith the dog, born without two functioning forelimbs, walking bipedally. Our ability to walk upright is one of the crowning achievements of human evolution. Faith did it in a year. There's a lot of plasticity in development. And if we don't appreciate the adaptability of development, we, are, we necessitate the need for exorbitantly complex explanations for things. Development is capable of doing a lot of things. I'm not talking magic. I'm just talking about organisms adapting in its environment. Let me show you. How would I mean in the concept of develop, development as construction? Here is a normal species, the Trevoa. Here's what it looks like as an adult. It's a bipedal species. This is what it, like I said, this is a day 50 Trevoa, and there it is in real life. But if you look at it back through its, through its early days, you can see there's a period of time when it's walking on four limbs. There's a period of time when it can't walk at all because its limbs are so long, it can only drag itself around. And then there's a period of life when it looks like a lot of other rodents. Voles, gerbils, germs, dormites. When they're born, they look, they don't look like gerboas, they look like rodents. But as they get older, their morphology changes. In the case of the gerboa, it's limbs elongate. These animals are squat. And this, for example, this vole um, engages in a behavior called punting, where it basically rotates around on its hind limbs. Then it becomes a walker and it becomes a trot. Gerbils also de develop through this series, but also bound. They take off on their hind limbs and they land on their forelimbs. That's called a bound. This animal also bounds. Notice how squat their bodies are. This animal eventually will gallop. And this animal will eventually walk on its hind legs. All of these animals go through the same developmental process, not because they have an instinct inside of their head that tells them to be a walker and a bounder and a galloper and a bipedal walker but because it adapts to its body in the same way that the two-legged dog does, in the same way that Johnny Eck was able to walk on its hands, if we are forced to, we will look for the instinct. We will say, aha, the jerboa has a bipedal instinct. But are we going to say that this animal has a bipedal instinct? Are we going to say that Johnny, walk, uh, Johnny Eck has a hand-walking instinct? Of course not. <clears throat> we would never do that, because we know that's absurd. But when we only focus on perfectly you know, shaped animals on the archetypes, we confuse ourselves, we create illusions for ourselves, we lose sight of the diversity of development. So the designation of instinct is reserved for evolved behaviors expressed by well-formed normal creatures, but the development of processes by which a dog without forelimbs walks upright or a man without legs walks on his hands are qualitatively the same as those by which a jerboa or a human learns to walk upright. So anomalies help us to appreciate the developmental process <coughs> with a clarity that is lost by focusing on well-formed organisms alone, and that by considering the anomalous, we look for common developmental processes that in all animals make functional behavior possible. So for example, let's go into the brain. If you look at, if you take a blind mole rat, and here are these big front teeth that will dig in their tunnels, and they're called tooth diggers. And you look at cerebral cortex, and you look at the representation of this animal's body in the cerebral cortex. This is the amount of cortical tissue devoted to those teeth. This is the amount of tissue devoted to its forelimbs. Huge, huge cortical teeth. And if you look at a star-nosed mole, very, very ugly creature. You can all agree on that. These animals have these little appendages on the front of their face, and they, they use them like little fingers, and they gather food. They're one of the fastest foragers in the world. These are the little appendages right here. And then we go into the cerebral cortex, and lo and behold, this is the amount of cortex devoted to that appendage. And this, look how big these claws are, and look how big. And you're going to say, aha, well, the cortex evolved. It predetermined its ability to reflect its body. But that's not what we know to be the case. In fact, the cortex develops its relationship to its body. How do we know this? 
We can take an animal like a short-tailed opossum. If we look at its cortex, we see that the touch senses is, is represented here, the visual senses here, the auditory senses here. But if we blind these animals at birth, if we remove its eyes at birth, we find that the cortex reorganizes. The visual area is gone, and all of this other tissue here that was visual is now responding to touch and sound. So you have a real-time reorganization of the cortex based upon the morphology of the animal with which it develops. A very bizarre case, a three-eyed toad. Researchers took an embryonic eye, placed it on the forehead, and when they looked at the cerebral cortex, they found ocular dominance columns just like you find in mammals, but never in reptiles, because they created an artificial situation in which the eyes could compete with each other for cortical tissue. We talk briefly about context, sensitivity, and contingency. Here, these are bizarre. I, I frankly admit these are bizarre pictures. Here's a case of cyclopia in a kitten, that prosopia in a kitten, uh, also in a kitten. Okay? Notice the single eye, notice the double face. Also a condition that happens in animals. It's a very disturbing picture. I mean, these children are yet generally um, rarely born alive. When they are, they live less than 24 hours. Um, Notice the, this baby was born, I think, just last year in India. Um, I don't know the source of this one. Notice this right here. Here's the way Wilder, a bioembryologist in the early part of the 20th century, drew this problem. This is what most of us are familiar with, human faces. But there are also these humans that have a psychopathic condition, either a single slit, I, again, notice this thing above. Here's the other end of the situation, diprosophia, two phases. But then you look at it all in one big series and you start to see the continuity that connects all of this. When you look at them as individuals, they each look as individual freaks. When you put them all in a line, you start to see the common developmental pattern. But notice what happened here. Notice this thing. It's a proboscis that exists above the eyes here and is now gone, but now we have a nose. No nose, no. What happened? Now see, if we were, if we were looking at a cyclopic individual, if we were just simply say, okay, well, where's the nose? It must have lost its gene for a nose. I mean, if anything should have a gene or a set of genes, it should be a nose, right? Where's the nose? Obviously, the gene for the nose went off with the gene for two eyes. They took a, went off on a date, you know, came out. Well, we know that's not the case. Well, here it is, it's it blown up. Here you can see what's happening. And notice this interesting relationship to an elephant. Very same shape. Now, I'm not saying a cyclopic infant is an elephant, but I'm saying that there's something that connects these two creatures. And it has to do with the fact that nose tissue, when it develops above the eyes, turns into a proboscis. But when the eyes develop so that there is a, a hole in between them that allows those cells to descend, they develop as a nose here. They develop as a proboscis here, same cells. They develop as a proboscis here. They develop as a nose there. Context and contingency matter to the development of tissue. Let's take another one, turtle. One of the most freakish creatures on the planet. And if you look at the, I didn't know this until I read about this. And I was studying this and I said, wow, this is interesting. Did you ever notice that turtles don't have ribs? Where are the ribs? And if you look right here, there's just no rib. But if you look at inside the turtle, you see that there are the ribs, they're inside the shell. Well, you might say, well, turtles didn't have ribs. So they had a shell to protect them in ways that losing the ribs, you know, that turns out not to be the case. The reason why the animal does not have ribs is because it has a shell, or put it differently. The reason why it has a shell is because it doesn't have ribs. What happens is that this is the way most of us develop. We have ribs that grow down and our arms and our legs are on top of the rib cage. But in the case of turtles, the ribs grow out. And when they grow out, they do not grow around. And when ribs grow in the skin, they could produce a shell. In other words, the shell did not have to evolve specially. It needed just simply to develop 
in the context of ribs growing inside the skin. And this is how you can have very rapid evolution. <clears throat> Evolutionary speaking, turtles evolved very, very quickly. And they evolved quickly because there was a developmental change which caused their ribs to grow out rather than around, and that led to the development of the shell. One last point, interchangeability. <coughs> Here are two different types of developmental problems. What's called mirror image duplication in the forelimb of a frog, and mirror image duplication in a human being. In humans, this is often a, a mutation. But in frogs, it's because of parasitic infestation. Parasites invade the growing limb bud and can cause deformations, including your mirror image deformation. In other words, there are two different paths to mirror, image duplica mirror limb duplication. One is a genetic mutation, and one is an environmental change induced by parasites. In the case of British grass snakes, here's a, a and, and human beings, dicephalus, here is a very famous, um, there are two famous twins, that are really clear, there are two people, Abigail and Brittany Hensel, usually in humans, a mutation. But this is not a mutation, these are not mutants. These animals become two-headed because they are incubated in temperatures that are too hot. If the mother, they, they're raised in, in heaps of trash, or, or basically rotting uh, soil, that produce heat. If the heat is too high, you often will get two-headed snakes. Two paths to two-headedness. One environmental and one mutation. And now my favorite example of all is the fact that we all accept that males and females especially in humans, other mammals. Females are XX, males are XY. We accept that as a fact. What is the essence of being a human being or a human male or a human female? XX and XY. I ask my students this question all the time, and they always say XX and XY. But there's also a phenomenon known as temperature-dependent sex determination. And this happens because the cascade of genetic effects, of all genetic and epigenetic events, is very complex, and there are a variety of ways in which temperature and other factors can come in and influence how that system expresses itself. So none of us doubt that leopard geckos come in male and female varieties. Alligators come in male and female varieties. Turtles come in male and female varieties. But it's how their eggs develop that determines whether or not they will be a male or a female. Something as essential as male and female and yet these animals are, can be genetically identical. They can be clones, and yet one can be a male and one can be a female, only based upon the incubation temperature of the eggs. In some species, it's low temperatures lead to lots of males, and uh, high temperatures lead to, or low temperatures lead to lots of males, high temperatures lead to lots of females, and vice versa. Different species have different patterns. But the point is the same, temperature, so, um, to go back to my original thought to start this talk, words often get in the way, and the concepts that those words are connected to often get in the way too. And the words that I think get in the way are things like God, mind, genes, design, creation, which I think are often used interchangeably, oftentimes without us even knowing it. And then there are these false dichotomies, freaks and normals, internal and external forces, development, and evolution. In the end, I believe that creativity is a developmental process. If we really want to understand creativity, we should be looking at how creative things develop. Because development, understanding how things change through time, is always the best antidote to overly complex explanations for natural phenomena.